Do you wish 3D modeling didn't feel so stiff and tedious? Or maybe that it felt more intuitive like physical modeling? Then stick around, because that's exactly what we're covering today. So today we're going to start a short series on rapid form studies, or massing models as they're sometimes known. This is the kind of modeling you find yourself doing most often at the beginning of a project when speed rather than complexity is the desired result. Maybe the most important thing at the beginning of any design project is to get ideas out of your head as quickly as possible. For a long time, since basically forever, designers have used sketching as a means to document and to explore their ideas early on in a design process. But sketches are limited as they're a fundamentally two-dimensional media. This is where models come in. Now I'm not talking about fancy presentation models made of the finest materials. I'm talking about working models, and one kind of model in particular. Architects and designers love foam models, and we should ask ourselves, why? As I see it, there are at least three reasons for this. Number one, they are simple. No detail, only one color, no texture. They have only what they need to communicate basic ideas of shape and form. Number two, they are worked easily while maintaining the expression of volume. And they're worked really intuitively as well. Carving, sculpting, these are things that even a preschooler can do. And it's not like a folded paper model or a glued bunch of sticks or something like that. It's volumetric by its very nature. It's always going to illustrate some quality of volume and mass. And number three, as a result of reasons one and two, they are very fast to produce, which is why you see them littered all over the floor of architecture studios everywhere. So I'd say a good goal for us would be to see if we can emulate some of these qualities of physical modeling in a digital modeling environment. Let's check it out. Oh, and I almost forgot, best of all, no burning foam fumes. <laughs> Seriously, that stuff will take years off your life. It's disgusting, it's disgusting. So I'm gonna demonstrate some of these techniques using this site outlined in red here in the site model that I've got within this urban context. And if you wanna learn a little bit more on how to find and import your own site models that are similar to this, go ahead and check out that video that we've got on the topic. So I'm going to start out by dragging out a copy of this site. And this is just going to give me a little bit more room to work and develop these massing studies without the context kind of getting in the way. Of course, I'm going to want to evaluate any decisions I make with the context present. But for right now, as I'm just starting to kind of develop these ideas, this is going to give me a little more room to work. And this is also a good time to talk about one of those qualities that I'm trying to emulate from physical foam models, and that is that they're easy to work while always maintaining a representation of volume. Now in 3D software, we can model using all kinds of different techniques. We can use curves, we can use surfaces, but the ones that I think we want to use for this exercise are going to be solids. They're always going to represent a mass, and I can edit them very quickly relative to other kinds of geometry. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to start out by extruding the boundary of our site vertically, and this is going to give me a representation of the building envelope here that I have to work within. Great. So I'm going to make a copy of this. I'm gonna grab with the gumball holding Alt and drag out a copy. Now what I did seems really simple, but it's actually subtly very powerful and let me explain. When I went to go create a copy of this, I didn't have to go to a menu, I didn't have to click an icon, I didn't even have to enter a command, which is normally what I would do. I, all I had to do is move my mouse down to the move handle, hold Alt and drag this volume over. The real power in this is that this doesn't only work with entire volumes, it works with parts of volumes as well. So what I can do is I can hold Control and Shift to activate sub-object selection and click on any face and manipulate it. I can click on any edge and manipulate it. Or I can click on any number of points and manipulate those. So very easily, I can start manipulating mass very, very quickly. And I also think that the gumball as a means for moving, scaling, rotating geometry 
it just starts to feel much more natural and much more intuitive than kind of command-based entry or other modes of modeling. So I'm gonna just delete this and drag out that copy again. And let's develop a series of massings based on these kinds of techniques. So let's say I want to develop a kind of low perimeter block with a tower attached to it. I'm gonna grab this top face and bring that down. Simple. I'm gonna grab that entire volume now. And if I hold Alt and I scale, I can create a scaled copy of that volume. I'm just gonna scale in the other direction, this time without holding Alt, and then move that to the back of that box. I'll use sub-object selection again to grab this top surface and pull up to create my tower. Now, while this isn't the most complex massing, of course, I modeled it very quickly and in a fashion that I think is very, very natural. Now let's see how we can take this a step further. So I'm gonna select these volumes, hold Alt, and drag out another copy. Let's say I want this tower to taper from the bottom to the top. No problem. I just use Control Shift to sub-object select this edge and slide it over. Simple. Let's do it again. Drag out another copy. Maybe I want to manipulate the base of that tower portion to be wider at the base and to generate a kind of twisting volume. So I'll grab this vertex and I can use the planar move constraint with my gumball. Oop, wrong vertex. to generate a kind of twisting, tapering in two directions now, tower. Great. I select again and drag out another copy. And maybe I need to manipulate this top a little bit. So I can select maybe this front edge and I can scale it. And let's bring that down. And there we go. Maybe that's enough for this study. I also like to note that the way that I like to work when I'm doing these kind of massing sequences is to drag out a copy each time I make an edit. And I do this for two reasons. The first is that it serves as a kind of reminder of the steps and the procedure that got me from point A to point whatever. The second is that it allows me at any point in time to continue the development along a certain path without having to undo anything. Let's say I didn't want to go all the way to this kind of twisting, faceted version of the tower. Let's say I wanted to stop at that tapered version and develop a new variation of that. I can just drag out a different copy. If I was modeling this all in kind of one shot, I'd only be able to undo steps in order to get back to this state. Here, they're all visible and available to me. And I think this is actually a subtly very powerful technique of having the entire timeline and the sort of story of the development of your project available to you in the model. So obviously not all tools are gonna to be available to us through gumball edits, but there are a number of edits that we can make here under the solid edit tools that I think are useful to look through. Now, I don't like to use the menus necessarily as the method for actually doing the edits. I much prefer to enter commands, but the menus are really great when you're just learning the commands to figure out what possibilities are available and exploring all the options that Rhino gives us. So I can look here at faces and maybe fold face is something I want to experiment with. So I'll grab this face and I'll come here to the midpoint. And now it's asking for an angle or first point to reference. So maybe I'll grab here and we can pull this back. And I don't wanna move that bottom face, which it's asking me for now. So I'll just hit enter. And now I have a mass that tapers backward. Great. So I'm gonna copy this over just like I was doing before and I can continue editing this. 
Maybe this side comes down. Great. And I'll drag out another copy. And this time, maybe I want to create a cavity within this tower. And I can do that via, via the options for holes and creating holes with make hole. And make hole is going to need a hole profile for input. So I'm going to make one with a rectangle. I'm going to, I'm going to employ the vertical option and draw a rectangle vertically. Roughly position this how I'm imagining. Maybe I need to scale it down a little. Going in those directions. Maybe I want to kind of follow the profile of my mass. And now I can use make hole, selecting my hole profile and selecting the surface I want to cut. And I have a cut surface. Great. Let's make another copy of this over. And now let's try editing this with my sub object selection in the gumball. Let's say I want to move this. And here we can start to see where sub object selection and gumball edits start to break down. You're pretty safe whenever you're dealing with a box, a solid box in any way. So where I was before here, these are all just versions of a simple box, right? When I got to this version with a hole cut in it, I'm now outside of the standard box paradigm. This is where you have to be careful. Things can start to get squirrely. It's not that this can't be fixed, it's just that it can't be fixed as quickly as it's just that it can't be fixed as quickly as we were able to make all these edits. So don't let this stop you. I mean, if you want, you can extract this surface, delete it, and then rebuild this. I'll just draw curves here from point to point and from point to point and use edge surface maybe to rebuild that. And now I have something a little more like what I expected. But the takeaway here is that you may not be able to accomplish all edits via this method, but I think you can get a long way with using those methods. And soon you'll be able to anticipate what changes you can and what changes you can't make using gumball and sub object selection type edits. One tip that'll help in this regard is you should keep your individual poly surfaces separate for as long as you possibly can when you're using this kind of editing method. What it lets us do is basically have a kind of box that we can always edit easily with this sub object and gumball method for as long as we possibly can. As soon as we cut a hole on this, it becomes not a box and subject to some weird behavior when we do these kinds of edits. And as for the other two qualities that we mentioned about uh, foam massing models. I think that uh, we've kind of already met those by default here. Uh, the idea is that we keep them simple, right? I'm not including windows and handrails and parapets and all kinds of other elements that would likely be a part of any project that look like this. I'm keeping it as simple as possible. It's really just about the volume. Um, this can also be helped a little bit by rendering style, and you can see my homage to blue foam here in these studies. Um, but the reading of this as just kind of a simple, you know, white mass context, and let's move one of our studies in here. Let's uh, maybe this guy. I'll move. into our site. We can very quickly start seeing how our massing sits within a context with very little distraction. I don't have much to analyze about this other than 
how does this massing work with its context? And I can see I'm probably, probably not being so kind to these neighbors over here, but uh, that's what my context model is for. It's there to tell me that. So um, take some of these techniques, try them out. Uh, if you run into issues, let me know. Let me, let me hear about it in the comments. And uh, I hope you guys are able to find uh, a way to integrate this into your workflow. All right, thanks. So I hope you're able to find ways to put these techniques into practice in your next project. And more generally, I hope you're getting more comfortable with the idea of this kind of like loose and sketchy 3D modeling style. I know for myself at least that when I can let go of this idea that every model needs to be watertight and precise and totally perfect, that I have a lot more fun in this process. And the more fun I'm having doing almost anything means the more time I'm going to spend doing it. And in design at least, that usually leads to better outcomes. I'll catch you guys in the next video, which will take another look at a similar kind of approach, just using a more organic or sculptural modeling technique. Thanks again for watching. Happy modeling.